Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Moreau Seiler, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Dr. Joe Schmutz will be speaking about how did golden eagles respond to a changing northern Great Plains ecosystem. Personally, I'm quite excited about today's presentation because Joe was supposed to present at the recent Prairie Conservation Endangered Species Conference back in February, uh, but there were unfortunate technical difficulties. So I'm really looking forward to today's uh, presentation. Before we begin, I'd like to state that we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. Just a few items before we get going, I'd like to note that PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series is a monthly presentation about anything to do with Native Prairie conservation or species at risk, and we will be hosting two presentations in May. So I'd like to invite everyone to join us on May 15th uh, for a presentation by the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Centre regarding data collection, sharing and uses. And on June 19th, in celebration of Native Prairie Appreciation Week, we'll be hosting a webinar about archaeology in Saskatchewan, and we'll be taking a break in July. As always, you can register for these webinars through the PCAP website. And a reminder to all of our listeners out there, um, as we have over 200 registrants, you'll be muted for the duration of the webinar. But if you have any questions during the presentation, just type it into the questions section and you can do it at any time during the presentation and questions will be answered towards the end of the webinar. And now that we're on Zoom, you're welcome to upvote other people's questions if you have the same one. I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our presenting sponsors, Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association, North American Helium, Nutrium, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, and SaskTel. So without further ado, ado uh, a bit about today's presenter. Joseph Schmutz is a naturalist who received a Master's of Science degree from the University of Alberta and a PhD from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Joe is retired from the University of Saskatchewan, where he was a member of the Biology Department, the Centre for Studies in Agriculture, Law and Environment, and the School of Environment and Sustainability. Joe studied prairie raptors in southern Alberta for over three decades. So with that, I'm pleased to pass it over to you, Dr. Schmutz. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Um, thank you for uh, ferreting me through the process and all the preparation. And uh, thank you all who are in the background uh, for joining us today. So as uh, Taitl Caitlin has given us the, the, the outline, the title, and what I'd like to do is three things. Uh, describe golden eagles in today's mixed grass prairie. Then instead of what we mostly do, do is try to look forward, I'm going to try and look back for and how things might have been for eagles in the past. Can their current ecological characteristics, how they might have fared uh, 200 years ago? Then at the end, uh, we'll see if we can say anything about what the take message would be, can be, what we've learned from it, and uh, how we might try to proceed with this ecosystem into the future. So um, uh, this, this slide um, very quickly, uh, you, I'll, I'll have to say that some of my slides are gonna be fairly complicated and uh, we're not gonna look at every detail of them because, but um, sometimes uh, complexity is the message and, uh, and we'll see how that works for us today. So in this slide, it shows some bison, it shows a rubbing stone, it shows a teepee ring, it shows uh, the painting of a roundup as it might have been around 1900. It shows a plow that was abandoned uh, as, um, as a sign of a use of the prairie that was incompatible and uh, was not sustainable and led to a lot of pain uh, by the people who settled and tried to make a living on the prairies. And then finally, um, there is um, 
a young person releasing a burrowing owl, sort of touching on um, the idea of endangered species and how we might proceed uh, in, in that vein. So this, this talk is really an outgrowth of a manuscript that we're working on. And I teamed up with Stuart Houston, who provided most of the data. He's been banding uh, eagles and, and recording data for 43 years. Uh, Stuart and I were, decided to team up and, and put this together for publication. And we're still in the process of that. We decided to expand the story from Saskatchewan and include um, uh, something about the rest of Canada. And that included Richard Fife data, who worked for the Canadian Wildlife Service, and recently Dan Szalenchuk, who has taken over Stewart's uh, study area and is still doing the work there. The yellow, the, uh, the map on the left shows that golden eagles occur all over Canada, but primarily in the West and primarily in the north. And the yellow uh, uh, arrow on the left shows, uh, and the expanded uh, panel shows Stuart Houston's study area on the South Saskatchewan River in southwestern Saskatchewan. Um, the eagle food, there, Stuart collected 340 items between 1969 and 2002, and the breakdown is, White-tailed jackrabbits, 30%, water birds, 26%, ground squirrels, 16 fishes, uh, four, and snakes, uh, less than one. And there are many other species uh, in, in smaller numbers for a total of 37 species in total. And uh, this study, uh, these eagles showed the, the highest food niche breadth uh, among 34, 35 species of raptors that have been uh, reported. So the point here, and I think that um, tells us, that explains a lot of what has been happening. Uh, the eagles are very diverse in the food they use. They're very capable in using a wide variety of, of prey species. Um, not all things have gone well for them, though. Uh, this graph shows how their main food has changed. And jackrabbits, you see the red dots uh, as a line, the, the, the trend line through um, the declining number of jackrabbits in Stuart's sample. And actually, this is, uh, this is a note of some concern, and that's recently come to fore. Uh, my own work in the Hannah study area shows a very similar pattern. So the decline is happening, happening in two different provinces. And there has been some work recently where the authors concluded that the white-tailed jackrabbit is, is declining throughout the Great Plains, north and south. And the reasons are not entirely obvious. In one case, in one area, it might be uh, a lot of shooting in other areas, it might be habitat change, and also there is some concern over climate and and so forth. So this is something that we should probably keep our, keep an eye out for in the future. The other, the green line shows squirrels and Richardson's ground squirrels primarily, and they have had a high over in, in the in the, around the 1980s. And that has been documented in other areas. Same happened in my own study area. And it just shows the, the eagles are quite opportunistic when, when species rise in numbers, they take advantage of it as one would expect. And the same happened with water birds, uh, mostly ducks, actually mostly mallards. Um, and there was a high in the 1970s, then a low for some period, a rise in the 1990s, and we hope that uh, bird flu doesn't decimate them too badly uh, going forward. So these are some trends. Um, and and I, I mentioned the, the concern about rabbits. Uh, what about year round? Um, the map on the left shows the concentrated banding area and all the locations. We just threw them all on the map. But then the interesting part is that the eagles go down the, the eastern part of the Great Plains and they go, they go to winter in the southern states, um, anywhere from about uh, even South Dakota on down to Texas. And they spend a lot of time at uh, prairie dog colonies in, in that area. 
The picture on my right is uh, uh, Stuart Houston himself banding two young eagles. And you can see uh, barely there's the rear end of a jackrabbit, uh, one of their main foods. And it also shows where they nest. They often nest on these on these cliffs, these eroded cliffs in Cooley um, and, and Badland habitat. And uh, there is Stuart, you can see the rope. He is wearing a harness and, and who is going down for safety using this, using this rope. Um, so, and in terms of density, um, the, the nesting density of, of Stuart's eagles is comparable to uh, other densities reported throughout the Western United States at 102 to 191 kilometers squared per pair. So the eagles have, they're, they're not very dense in their, in their nesting distribution. They use a, a large home range. Nest success, the same story. It's almost, it's, it's very similar to other studies. The same with young per pair, very similar to other studies. So eagles, golden eagles have done remarkably well. Uh, along with geese, raven, white-tailed deer, they've been increasing on the Great Plains in, in, in our area, and, uh, but all is not well. Some other raptors, grassland birds, insectivores, and now jackrabbits are declining. So let's leave that topic and have a look then at how eagles might have fared in the past. Um, uh, the ecosystem, uh, like all ecosystems, have some big drivers, and this one shows um, the Palliser Triangle, and I'm going to rely on Palliser quite a bit uh, just in a moment. And so you can see that there is a void of clouds uh, over the Palliser Triangle, and you can also see the Missouri Coteau, the rise in land between the Saskatchewan Plain and the Alberta Plain. And uh, it goes to show that land and atmosphere interact, and the rain shadow of the Rocky Mountains is the very, the, a very obvious um, 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 uh, outcome of that interaction. Uh, Captain John Palliser's expedition ran from 1857 to 60. Uh, the point was for him to look for a, a possibility to establish a rail connection between central Canada and the West Coast. Vancouver and, uh, and much of the West Coast has been bustling in terms of economic activity, fishing, forestry, mining, and uh, transport uh, by ships. Um, and so the Eastern Canada wanted to connect. Also, um, U.S. ranchers were moving north and, um, and Eastern Canada wanted to uh, cut that off a little bit and lay claim to the land north of the 49th. So Captain Palliser included indigenous guides and their wives. And these were crucial, these people were crucial to, to, to guide them and help them survive. And apparently the indigenous guide said, there is no way we would go without our wives. And that was just, uh, uh, that was just part of the team that was necessary. It also included a botanist and a medical doctor. And this is somewhat unusual for, Stuart tells me anyway, for expeditions at that time that uh, a well-educated person uh, pertinent um, with pertinent expertise was, part was participating in, uh, in these expeditions. And then there were military personnel and also Hudson's Bay Company employees. The map here shows on the lower right hand, uh, my right hand, it shows uh, Fort Gary, lower Fort Gary and Fort Gary around Winnipeg, right basically in Winnipeg. And that's where they came by canoe or by, by ship and then canoe to Winnipeg. That's when they assembled uh, their team. That's when, where they got the horses, they got um, Métis wagons, um, and then they started uh, you, you can see these lines, these lines that I've drawn uh, indicate roughly, as much as I could tell from uh, a Spry's description, their route. So they first went down to Pembina, and, and this was the, there was, um, uh, the, there was already a convention to consider the 49th parallel, the boundary between the U.S. and Canada, and there was an office there that was um, inhabited by both Canadian and US personnel. 
From there, they went along the 49th and then to Fort Ellis and on further west. Now, um, um, Palliser was a little bit mistaken. He thought he covered a lot more of the distance along the 49th, but there's a fairly big gap, basically much of uh, southern Saskatchewan he didn't actually get to. Uh, he knew there was a gap, but he didn't know it was that big. So he went to Fort Ellis, and then they went through Stuart's study area, and uh, we, you can imagine how difficult it was to cross the rivers with these carts and what have you. And then they went up to Fort Carlton, which was with was um, a very important area, um, a very important site in the fur trade and so forth, and also um, as a, a, a station for um, military establishment and, and what have you. And from there, they went uh, west. They often took side trips, which I didn't include here. They went west to Fort Edmonton and ultimately down south toward the, the, um, the mouth of the uh, Red Deer and uh, River into the South Saskatchewan, down along the Sand Hills into the um, uh, Cypress Hills, and then west again uh, to, 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 to look for some mountain passes. Now, I didn't include really anything about their uh, trips through the mountains. They spent a lot of time trying to find the right passes to put the railroad through. And they also uh, did some shorter trips uh, out of the parkland and into the boreal forest. So I did, I did not include these. So let's see what they could say. They basically concluded that um, they were in an ecosystem that was dominated pre by bison grazing and fire. The way to exist in that ecosystem as it was, was to either hibernate, go dormant, or migrate. It, was, it is the core of the core of, of the Pallas or Triangle and our Northern Great Plains is the most arid area in North, North America. Step aside, uh, uh, New Mexico and Arizona. We've got the, the most arid spot right here. So the, the data I'm now going to talk about or, uh, are by uh, out of the book by Irene Spry and called the Palliser Expedition. Now, I, uh, there's a, we don't need to look at all of these, but the, these notes, but so these are basically comments that I took out of Spry's book. They're comments in this case about grass for horses, and they're somewhat sequentially from Winnipeg to uh, uh, southwest, southwestern um, uh, Alberta. So one of the early comments is excellent grass. Next comment, splendid knee-high grass, and then eaten by grasshoppers. Good grass, little grass. Buffalo and locusts swept away what little grass there was. Some are drawing to a close. Note, note now they went, this was over three years, so there were different seasons involved. Fair grass, good in patches, and so on, and found fine feeding ground near a large lake. Horses improved. Their and dead entire trip was hard on horses. It was hard on people too. They were all hungry often, and they also had a difficult time finding good water. So let me move on to the next one. It, it, and uh, this is a comment about water supply. So south of Winnipeg, fresh and salty marshes and lakes is what they found. They found a small well. They began to carry water. Still many lakes, a pretty lake they found with ponds, good water supply, a beaver dam. Swamps started to be dried up. They came on to a lake with saturated, it was saturated with salt. I suspect it's Redberry Lake from just from the description. They went to Jackfish Lake and spent a night there. There was they had a Hudson's Bay Company base and crew that lived there year round. Uh, water scarce, found small lakes and marshes, and so on and so forth. You see, you see the, um, the in this this eco region that is so arid that water would be something that would be challenging for them to find in decent amounts and decent quality. The next uh, series of comments is. Um, Comments on prairie and campfire. Uh, for the first campfire at south of Winnipeg was one where they used green wood to, to cook and, and so forth. Next time they used buffalo dung instead. 
and then they concluded that they should expect no more wood westwards in in the valleys and they needed to carry some wood then in in those in those metis uh, wagons no wood at all they just used buffalo dung and the buffalo dung worked for a campfire except if it had been raining and the buffalo dung was soaked wet it just wouldn't burn at all again no wood then they found some willow birch and poplar so the wood was along streams or creeks um that's where the wood could persist and, and was protected somewhat from the prairie fires and uh, I think that might also have had an impact on eagles. The eagles nest along in trees along these, along these creeks, and they nest on cliffs along the rivers. And I've always wondered why the eagles wouldn't expand into areas like other hawks, ferruginous hawks, that uh, expand and use trees in the open plains. So maybe, just maybe, that's a bit of a leftover of that time uh, 250 years ago, 200 years ago, when these creek areas and the river um, uh, breaks are the only place where they could find nesting and also more food than they could on the open range. There is one comment that Spry makes uh, taken from Palace's notes, and it says, I know you can all read, but let me just read it so we can coordinate our thought. No sooner had they set out than the explorers encountered difficulties about food for their own horses. The pasture was poor over large areas, partly because spring was late and partly because there had been bad fires the year before. Indeed, Palliser came to the conclusion that much of the country uh, that was then open prairie had once been wooded. The trees had been destroyed by frequent fires. And he actually might be on to something because I, as I understand it, some of the late cores on the prairies showed um, a pollen from conifers. So it is possible and uh, so other people in the know might, con might confirm this or not. Uh, that after the glaciers left 10,000 years ago, it was probably cooler and maybe conifers um, uh, did well then. And then given uh, the, the dryness and given warmer climate, um, the grass predominated. Okay, so much about campfire and the wood for it. Now, what about wildlife? Uh, so here I took... Uh, I, the, I counted the number of times, for instance, bison was mentioned. Bison was mentioned by Spry on this. This is now the prairie part of the expedition, right? Not the mountains. 23 times. Bison was important for food. It's no doubt, no, no wonder that it was uh, mentioned that often. Um, elk were quite common. And deer, they described a short-tailed and a long-tailed deer, uh, deer, and those would, have, would be no doubt um, uh, the long-tailed being the white tail and, and the, the short-tailed the mule deer. Not very often. In fact, those four times, I think many of those were in the foothills. I think there was one occasion where along the Red Deer River, they described a deer. So deer were very sparse in, in those days. Caribou only in the Rockies. Prairie wolves, they said hundreds of. Uh, in some places, they talked about large wolves and sm smaller wolves. Um, I think they might have included the coyote as, as a prairie wolf, but they certainly had both. And uh, um, Banfield describes, definitely there were prairie wolves, describes two varieties even, or two subspecies that occurred on the prairie. Prairie grizzly, five times. They also used them for food. Beaver, they ate beaver when, when they, they had to. Badger were only mentioned twice, but they, they said many times badger were, many holes were found, badger holes. Water birds, quite common, used for food. Grouse only once, so not many sharp tails apparently, and not much for sage grouse either during that time. Frogs once, snakes, that was rattlesnakes, they ate some. And, uh, and insects, they often went on about insects. Mosquitoes just plagued them and particularly the horses. There was no mention of eagles, never a burring owl, never a ground squirrel, except one time they talked about a squirrel hill. Uh, no mention of jackrabbits. There were, there were uh, snowshoe hares in, in the wooden, uh, wooded trips, but there was no mention of jackrabbits. So it's tough to know what uh, uh, is probably not the best data in terms of surveys, 
but uh, it indicates that there were tremendous changes and very large differences in terms of the wildlife that existed then and, uh, and does today. The next uh, book I wanted to quickly summarize, 9,000 year indigenous occupation of these Southern Great or Northern Great Plains. And uh, Ray Grace Morgan makes much of buffalo jumps and pounds, buffalo pounds and fish weirs. And the beaver was protected. And the next uh, statement uh, explains why. Um, she says, because surface water is limited on the plains, beaver activity for building dams and thus creating ponds secures it in specific areas which enhance the potential for survival for early human populations. In fact, in an intense drought without beaver colonies, human occupancy on the plains might not have been possible at all. Since pedestrian peoples had limited mobility, knowing where beaver occupied areas were would have been a critical factor in their annual movement and settlement patterns. The, the picture that I added there is a, is a creek in southeastern Alberta, and there is a big cottonwood that has a, 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 an eagle nest in it with, I think it was too young. So this is the, uh, other than cliffs, these are the rarer places where eagle nested. And you can see here, this, uh, what I mentioned earlier, this uh, propensity to want to stick to creeks and that kind of habitat. We wonder why. Um, so here is, um, bear with me on this one. Um, it's uh, a, 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 a timeline, shall we say, from 1850 to 1940. And I'm just going to jump around. So let's look at bison first. From the eagle's point of view, uh, bison calves would have been attractive. And when mom wasn't looking, they would swoop down. And uh, this has been observed for, not necessarily for bison calves, but but uh, um, uh, other, other ungulates. The uh, eagles are just amazing in taking um, young, young of ungulates that are quite a bit larger than themselves. And they seem to simply injure them enough with enough strikes that uh, they are weakened and then and then they can kill it. Not a very pleasant sight from our point of view, but uh, that's what eagles do. So the, they would act, have access to calves and then carcasses. Um, Olson and uh, uh, um, in in his book on bison um, makes much of the carcasses that fed uh, a whole host of of other community and scavengers. In fact, Olson and Janelle, they uh, point out in the insect world, there are scavengers uh, or uh, insects that come to scavenge and not only scavenge the dead things, but also some of the other insects that come uh, are attracted to scavengers. And I just wonder whether eagles didn't do that also because eagles, the Mongolian hunters hunt uh, uh, their own coyote with eagles, and um, I think uh, an eagle could could be quite effective at um, uh, pursuing a coyote that comes to a to a carcass as well as the carcass. And then, as time went, so actually, so the 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 expedition was eighteen fifty to eighteen fifty seven to sixty. So you can see here there were still bison, but they were already getting thin. And then the bison disappeared around 1880. But then the replacement was domestic um, uh, uh, livestock, cattle, and that provided live and dead stock. So the carcass opportunity continues. Uh, the, the next panel, elk. Elk were quite common, as the notes describe. And, um, and, but deer were not. So deer came later. So... Once the dominant uh, landscape modifier, the bison, was gone, the, the shrub increased greatly in numbers. And trees have moved much further south into the prairies than they were at Palliser's time. So that also brought the deer. And the deer also, it, it is said, the deer followed the plow. So agriculture made the, the um, landscape much more hospitable to deer. So deer increased, and and this is now. Um, I would suggest that um, this is of great benefit to eagles because they did take calves or or fawns rather um, that Stuart found in the nests. 
So the arrival of deer and the expansion of the deer population on the Great Plains probably helped eagles significantly. Particularly when we think when Stewart collected the data, that was in June, right? That's when the, they were nesting and it was easy to tell what they were eating. But what were they eating in, in, in March when they arrived? What would eagles eat in, in October or before they leave? So that's where some of these other things, uh, carcasses, uh, young ungulates, and so forth, I think, uh, played a, a, a significant, more significant role. Chat rabbits, if we can take uh, um, uh, Irene Fry at her, wor at her word uh, and Palliser, were not very common. And they have no doubt similarly responded to the deer, to the brush invasion, because they're also browsers and probably became more common. And now we are faced with a decline that, that's not very well understood. Grass was highly seasonal. In fact, um, just listening to the descriptions, I wouldn't be surprised if our range, our grasslands are in considerably better shape than they were at the time of the bison. The, the frequent mention of the difficulty they had in terms of finding food for the horses was, was quite striking. And then once the bison disappeared, the uh, open range ranching uh, uh, became dominant. And some of the notes describe grass stir up high. And so uh, the grassland community uh, changed significantly. And then with the with settlement and the arrival of a European style agriculture, there was a steady loss. Um, the Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Administration, um, uh, PFRA, was a very welcome and needed institution that helped uh, make the shift from um, uh, cultivating everything that one could find in terms of land to keeping cultivation to uh, capable land and moving uh, grazing onto some of the other land that wouldn't fare well uh, when once cultivated. So if we look at the human enterprise, the railroad came to Calgary around 1880. Uh, the open range then uh, was, was common, as I said. Farming arrived early 1900s. And um, the range cattle, there was, a, there was a very severe storm, winter, and, and, a, and in particular, a couple of storms in 1906 to 07. 70% of the cattle that existed on the Northern Great Plains died. And I've, heard, I've seen estimates even higher. And so that uh, the ranchers suffered greatly. Um, ranching was a, was a, 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 a common uh, occupation. And there was a lot of investment out of the East to expand ranching, but that die off and that severe winter really uh, dealt a blow to the ranching community. And if that hadn't happened, uh, I think ranching would not have been so depressed and farming would probably not have taken over on, on land that couldn't sustain it, couldn't handle it. Uh, things might've turned out differently for us. So um, under my picture here, I see now there is in what we now have is in our revised ecosystem past Palliser, we have waste grain that helps geese arriving in spring greatly and in, and in fall. We have trees and shrubs that greatly assisted deer and, and jackrabbits um, in all likelihood. We have now roads, and uh, when you drive through the countryside in winter or fall and spring, you often see a roadkill, and there'll be raven on it, there might be an eagle on it, and so forth. So roadkills, hunter kills, uh, provide carcasses that, that, uh, that are common now. And then there is coprophagy, a sort of a more impolite topic, but um, I think we underestimate what that what that can do and the impact of eating feces by one animal of another um, in 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 the, in a food chain. So here I threw some slides on together as a collage, and I said uh, the Northern Great Plain now have a new driver have new drivers in the ecosystem. It is still changing. The change is ongoing. 
in fact, the change and the impact on in terms of conservation and biodiversity is so severe that the United Nations Conference of Parties in 2022 um, decided that a transformative change is necessary in order for us to cope with these changes. So the top three pictures here show on the very right hand top a white-tailed deer that is browsing, right? So this is an activity that Palliser would not have seen because there wasn't that much brush and there weren't that many deer. Uh, on the next to it, on the left, is a coyote with its head in the in the snow on a deer trail. And I went to look what it was, and there were deer pellets. So this is a coyote benefiting from the deer that reside here in the winter and and eating it, the the deer feces. Below the coyote is a coyote kill or a presumed coyote kill of a deer. So um, the, the arrival of the deer uh, has changed the predator community significantly. And that, of course, also puts pressure on other species. Um, in the case of burrowing owl conservation, predation is, is a significant factor. And I'm not one to ever say the good, uh, the good ungulate and the bad predator, because that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. They exist together in a community and they have their own checks and balances, but um, with a, such a substantial change of adding a new species into an ecosystem, there will be changes that come along with it. On the left is um, a city plan. So I think this transformative change needs to think and, and look more broadly onto the landscape, the ecosystem and into our future than just species. And that's going to be the rest of my message. So here is a city plan, and I think urban, urban ecology and urban pursuits need to be connected to pursuits on the land. That would be our best bet. Uh, below our cattle, there's a pond, there's some trees. These trees would not have been there at Palliser's time. That's part of the expansion, and uh, Stuart, and Stuart has actually described that very nicely in a couple of papers. On the right, this is a ranching family, and they're holding some ferruginous hawks. And it, the whole thing just kind of, um, I think, reminds us to look at the big picture and see what we might be able to tweak in terms of the big picture. Let's see, what have I got next? This is my last slide, one of the very complicated one. And um, so um, in the middle there, near the top of the big arrow, it says protection in different color. And I, I just can't help escape the thought that we've probably overthought that one. I wonder if endangered species legislation is still as pertinent as it was. I, I hate to get rid of it because uh, what else, unless we have something really better in, in its place. But something better, I think, would be endangered soil legislation. It, uh, uh, the ecosystem and communities, it all starts with the soil. It starts with the land. It's, it, the impact arrives with water. There need to be microbes and then plants and animals. And these plants and animals need to work in, in, in distinct ecosystem functions, pertinent ecosystem functions that can lead to change or stability and so on and so forth. So we have the human sphere on the left and the biosphere on the right. And uh, I think those are the big questions and the big drivers that I think we need to try harder, perhaps, to, to come to grips with. And then I've simply thrown in a whole lot of other words that, uh, that uh, may be pertinent and may be more important in some um, uh, aspects, in, in some actions and then, than others, like regeneration, for instance. There's much talk about uh, regenerative agriculture, and I think it has merit, and it is it would be a focus on soil, healing the soil in places where it is not healthy. Um, we have uh, culture, we need a cultural change, perhaps, uh, a bit of tweaking uh, to make that urban to rural to landscape connection in the kinds of lives we lead. 
So that is, um, is my uh, ending message. And I hope I have, I, I've covered a lot of ground and I hope I have made some sense with the examples, but um, I like to conclude that luckily, unlike other species on the Great Plains, eagles are doing remarkably well, and that's good for them. It's wonderful to have a good news story that, like the one the eagles can provide for us. Um, now we probably shouldn't shouldn't stop caring, but you know, especially the jackrabbit example. But unfortunately, so many other um, biodiversity elements on the on the northern Great Plains are suffering severely, and they're going to need our attention. And we need to pay attention also to ourselves in terms of how we m move forward. So I'd like to leave it there. And if there are any questions that I could answer, that would be wonderful and I would try. First of all, thanks so much for the really informative and detailed presentation. Um, I always love listening to you and just soaking in your wisdom. <laughs> Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you. <laughs> um, to all of our listen listeners out there, if you have any questions, uh, just type it into the question and answer section. Um, you're also welcome to send it by chat as well. Um, so feel free to take your time to do that. Um, so the first question, um, with eagles doing well, have you seen any density dependent responses by golden eagles as we've seen with bald eagles on Besnard Lake? Okay, I'm not familiar with the density dependent response at Besnard Lake, but um, uh, I would say the stability that the eagles show in terms of their numbers would suggest that they have been able to shift when density goes down, they have been able remarkably to shift to other, other sources of food. And so they, I think, have been insulated to a large degree so far by the, the shifts in density in the prey population, which is interesting. Um, and how do you think the prevalence of disease factors into survival of species and ecosystems? Right, big, big, important question. Yeah. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a disease in, the, in rabbits. Uh, mm. Uh, I can't think of it right now, but there are cases, and I think I think that is a big concern. the The authors who did the analysis on on the rabbits in the Great Plains, Brown was the first author, published in 2020. Um, they did not think that disease was a big factor in the decline to date, but that's certainly that's certainly a big open question and one one that is quite concerning um, in our time. As we know, disease has struck so many things, birds and us and what have you. So we live in a world where disease organisms are just having a heyday because we are in a global world and we transport them around and smiling. They're smiling all the way, I'm sure, if they can smile. Um, so yes, I think that is a very good question. And that is that is a difficult one that we need to work to, to stay on top of. Absolutely. Um, and I'll just mention that we had a webinar a couple months ago about uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza, and that is um, available on our YouTube channel. Um, and if you can't find it there, then just email me and I'll um, send you the link for it as well. But that um, I think it's listed as private, but it is available. Uh, there is a recording available. Um, and Okay, a listener named Paul says, um, nice talk. Any comment on the new federal concern with lead in rifle bullets? Uh, yes, actually that is for the scavenging eagles. And there are there's at least one publica uh, publication that shows that um, lead in the bloodstream, and I forget now whether that eagle was dead or it was sick. So yes, and then lead pellets, of course, you know, the some years ago, um, uh, there, there, were, there were studies to look at the impact of lead in, in geese, and eagles love to chase geese. And interestingly, I think the geese know it. When, when you see a flock of geese and the eagle flies over, they all get all worked up. So I think eagles like to eat geese, and they got a lot of lead. So I think the move to steel uh, for hunters, I think, was 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 very necessary. Now, I think that there, so for for rifles for big game hunting, 
Uh, we're not there yet, but I, there is talk about shifting to uh, more benign uh, material in the bullet as well, which I think would be very, very good to consider. Yes, that's a good one. Um, so going back to disease, we have a few questions there. Um, the one that you mentioned with rabbits, would it be rabbit hemorrhagic disease? That's the one. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> um, and then what are your thoughts about chronic wasting disease in an ungulate? Um, do you think there's any impact on eagles? I know this is out of your realm. <laughs> Um, now, I don't think there is any concern that eagles can catch chronic wasting disease. Chronic wasting disease and the other family of disease members uh, can switch, can jump species, but mm -hmm. it's, it's very rare. So personally, I wouldn't be too worried that eagles can, can catch um, uh, chronic wasting disease. But of course, I think uh, I doubt that we will be able to get hold of chronic wasting disease, uh, no matter how we try. I think that disease is and will continue to run its course. And uh, we can only hope that there are some there are some individuals that have a level of immunity, uh, for instance, sheep um, uh, uh, cope quite well with TSE. So uh, they're, 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 it's conceivable that there are mechanisms whereby uh, ungulates can also cope in the future. But I think until we get there, we will probably lose an awful lot of, of ungulates, especially deer and also elk. And it's it's unfortunate that we ever brought the disease here, but here we are. And uh, yeah, that that's another concern. So that would I think the the fear for for or the concern for eagles would be a lowering of the of the availability of ungulates either as young for food or as carcasses and and so on and so forth. So that that would that can easily could easily have an impact. That makes sense. Um, and I'll mention that we did have a, uh, a full webinar about chronic wasting disease, um, and that's available on our YouTube channel as well, a recording of it. And it goes into the details of um, where it's spreading, how it's spreading, and all the other species that can or cannot uh, contract it. Um, so while we're still on the disease topic, um, what are your thoughts about the avian flu? Um, do you think that raptors are at huge risk for it um either like from their food source or or other diseases that um that could impact raptors right right uh yes i think i think that is a concern especially for raptors uh my understanding is that um uh the influenza is carried by waterfowl particularly and um, and of course, raptors will eat, eagles will eat waterfowl, and especially carcasses. Um, so uh, that is a concern. I'm aware of some cases. In one case, mm -hmm. I know there was a, a pair of peregrine falcons where the, the, the hen was sick and she was tested and she later died and she had it. So um, raptors, it, it's a big concern. It's its difficult to know how that will unfold into the future. Very concerning. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we'll change gears a bit with our next question. Um, given the importance of beavers in regulating water on the prairie ecosystem, as referenced in Morgan's book, perhaps we should be promoting reintroducing beaver along um, on the prairies to better regulate moisture in this time of climate change. Absolutely. And uh, fortunately, some of that is happening. Uh, I think there has been beaver have been considered trouble and and uh, and people were paid to shoot them and so on and so forth. So I think luckily that is that is changing and and that's definitely for the better. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I, I don't know of any resources out there for people, but um, I know some people don't love beavers. <laughs> uh, they can see the damage that they do, but it's definitely something to, to think about is um, the importance of them. Yeah. Uh, the next question is from Claudia, and um, she says, thank you for all the great information and the history lesson, great photos. Um, and Claudia is wondering, what are the main predators of golden eagles and other raptors? Do they have predators? Um, so um, golden eagles uh, will have predators as nestlings and as young, and they will be 
large carnivores, um, wolves, possibly, likely, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think they have very many. And uh, they they, um, they have probably their best and their greatest enemies might be themselves. There is one report by an outfitter who saw a golden eagle strike a bald eagle and um, and the, the bald eagle broke its wing and, and it's not clear what that strike was about, whether it was territorial conflict or, or food, uh, potentially food related. So um, yeah, I think the uh, golden eagles probably do not have very many. They will in the juvenile stage, but uh, not otherwise. But it's, um, um, there are so many other things that golden eagles, for instance, as much as we need wind farms, um, they, they, they can suffer from wind farms. They also suffer and always have from flying into wires, for instance, mm. and electrocution and what have you. Interestingly, the other thing is um, because of their tendency to scavenge, the banding office uh, reports quite a few eagles that were trapped, that were caught in traps. And some could be let go and they survived and others were enough damaged by the trap that they had to be euthanized. So uh, there are all these dangers that, that, that are out there, which are less from other predators, but more from from uh, our, our human constructed environment and our built environment and and other our other activity poisoning um, poisoning of uh, prairie dogs and ground squirrels can have an impact that sort of thing so that's where I think the biggest danger lies rather than out of the other predators. That makes sense. What are your thoughts about power poles? Like over um, many decades, there's obviously a lot more power poles. Um, I I often see eagles sitting on them. <laughs> um, but your mention about electrocution, um, are power poles an advantage or disadvantage for golden eagles? Uh, I think they're probably an advantage to eagles and a whole host of other raptors that use them as a roost and a vantage point from which to hunt and so forth. Um, now, I think the, the the transmission industry has come a long way to changing what they do. They can build some shelters on top or they take they spread the insulators further apart and so forth. So I think electrocution, uh, the problem has been much reduced. Thank, thanks to people who uh, is one guy, Morley Nelson, for instance, in Idaho, and uh, he worked for for a transmission company, he was a falconer. And I think he gets a lot of credit for starting the initiative and raising the issue. And I think a lot of changes have happened. It goes to show that we can move in the right direction if we put our heads together. Absolutely. That's a great example. Um, our next question is about um, nesting structures. Um, do you think that the conversion of grassland to farmland might have taken with it those big cottonwoods that might have been former nesting structures for golden eagles? Have we relegated the flat lands to geometric farming grid, but the train of the coolies and riparian sites may have kept the plow at bay and golden eagle nest sites are safer in those habitats? Right, right. Right. When you think back to our the original map and Stuart's banding sites, they're all concentrated, uh, or most, are concentrated along the South Saskatchewan River and even Swift Current Creek. There are some. Um, there are some on the Frenchman, and then over in Alberta, the Old Man. All these rivers. It's remarkable how dependent or how how uh, preferentially those eagles tend toward those rivers, and. Um, the the eagles we like to say like to use remote they they require remoteness um they're they're very prone to disturbance by the way uh if you go to an eagle nest often you don't even see the parents the parents see you coming and they fly they watch you from a distance and uh, there's Stuart has very few notes where but there are some where he went to a nest and he and the eagle was stayed until the last kind of few meters. But that is a very rare thing. Most of the time they they fly uh, they fly away. So remoteness is important. Interestingly, the rivers in Saskatchewan and Alberta go through some some highly cultivated regions. 
And uh, lo and behold, uh, the eagles are still there as long as there is some grassland and it's it's that eroded um, uh, bank habitat, that coolie habitat that provides a sense of remoteness for them. Actually, the farm might only be a matter of five or 10 kilometers away, but because of the habitat along the river that's so difficult to negotiate by people other than on horseback, the, the, the eagles are quite insulated. So um, I think eagles probably have always been uh, relatively rare. And so I don't know if, I think there are other raptors that have been much more seriously impacted and other birds and other wildlife by our conversion to cultivation. I suspect eagles might be the one because of their remoteness, the, the tendency to, to seek those remote areas probably have been somewhat insulated from that factor, maybe. Thanks for that answer. Um, and a listener named Claudia is wondering if um, there are any uh, potentially human origin diseases that would pose a risk for eagles or other prey birds. Do you know anything about that at all? Any human? Um, <laughs> no, uh, no, I have no idea. Very interesting question. I wonder, yeah, I, I, I just don't know. Yeah, probably the best place to look into it would be like the CDC or Ministry of Environment or something like that. And, well, yeah. you know, sometimes, sometimes um, there are so many things we simply don't know, right? We kind That's of, right. Uh, we kind of rely on the tip of the iceberg. And I think the, there is a tendency to want to pursue more and pursue more, but I think we know enough about the plight of biodiversity and sustainability in our world that we know enough to make important actions. So I think we should explore as many questions as we can, but we shouldn't let that paralyze us in terms of uh, moving on the actions that we know we can already employ. That's kind of a side, uh, side issue on the questions, but, but one that occupies my mind. Absolutely. And so um, I know that you're retired from the University of Saskatchewan, um, but you're obviously still very connected and passionate about um, prey raptors and birds in the prairies. Um, what do you have on the go next? Oh, you know, um, I, I like to say that um, biology and science and natural history, it's just a fascinating, a fascinating pursuit. And uh, I consider myself so lucky that I've been able to, to pursue a career in biology. I think there is no better life that I, I would wish for that so uh, or want to have. So I continue. Um, like I said, uh, we started that article and we're working on, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly large paper on eagles, but it pulls a lot of things together. So we have that on, on the go and I'm an avid uh, bird hunter mostly. And uh, um, just yesterday we got back from counting uh, sharp tail grouse on dancing grounds in the area where I hunt and I gather information on every sharp tail that my dog and I flush and every bird I shoot, I take home and, and have lots of interesting information. And, and that has now gone on for 10 years, such that the, the, the results are very interesting. Uh, for instance, um, the number of grasshoppers I find in the crops of sharp tail grouse has steadily mm -hmm. gone down. And uh, the number on dancing grounds, I know other people call them leks, but um, the, I call them dancing grounds for some reason. Um, I know what the reason is, but it doesn't matter. Um, anyway, we, we counted on, on leks as well, or dancing grounds over 10 years, and there has been a gradual and steady decline of the number of males attending and females attending those leks. And fortunately this year, we just finished the count, the numbers have been up significantly. I haven't tallied the numbers quite all over the 12 grounds that we, Ken and I visited. And uh, that is a really good sign. It's a very welcome sign. I, I never expected that to happen. I suspect it might have to do with last June uh, was a very dry month. And that is the month when the chicks hatch. And during those early two, maybe even three weeks, 
if there is a long, uh, a persistent rain and some cool weather, uh, it's hard for the hen to, to brood those chicks and uh, they need to go and eat and how do they stay dry and so on and so forth. So I think that is a very critical period and uh, the dry June last year might just be one of the biggest factor, whatever it was, it's, it's, uh, it's very welcome to see that uh, we can point toward the eagles having done so well, the sharp tails uh, hopefully continue in some sort of recovery. And uh, that is just nice to see and it's a good positive message. Absolutely. And when your paper's finished, you'll have to let me know when I can share it on our social media and, and then with everyone who's interested in eagles. So I think that's a really great resource. And yeah, let me know. <laughs> Perfect. Well, this brings us to one o'clock to the end of our webinar. So um, Joe, I just want to thank you again for the really awesome webinar. We've had lots of people write in about how informative it was and um, how many different perspectives that you brought together. So I just want to reiterate their comments and say thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Caitlin, for ferreting me through it. And thanks for the good question and uh, for listening. Thanks. And to all of our listeners, thank you so much for catching today's webinar. When you leave, there'll be a quick one-minute survey. If you don't mind filling it out, it helps us keep our Native Prairie Speaker Series going into the future so we can report back to our funders. And also be sure to check out our other upcoming webinars that we have going on in um, May and June. So with that, thank you so much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day.